Good afternoon and welcome to this next online event by the New Haven Preservation Trust. My name is Rona Johnston and as board president here at the Trust, it's my very great pleasure to welcome so many of you today. We have almost 150 people registered for this event. Talks and tours are an integral part of the work of the Trust and we want to provide opportunities for people to talk about and learn about historic places and explore how these historic buildings and streetscapes can continue to be relevant today and on into the future. And while we can't currently gather safely in person, we are delighted that the online format opens up new opportunities like the talk we'll hear today. If you would like to help us plan such events and perhaps you have suggestions for topics and particularly speakers, uh, we do let us know. Uh, this is your forum and we want to engage a wi as wide an audience as possible. Uh, you'll find contact information uh, for the Trust on our website, nhpt.org, and we would be delighted to hear from you with any thoughts about how we can take these online presentations forward. So to today's talk. Uh, after the illustrated presentation today, our speaker is happy to answer questions. As we are in the webinar format, uh, we can only take questions typed by you as audience members, but please, as the talk comes to an end, please do type up your questions in the chat function, uh, and then we will read them out and give the speaker a chance uh, to respond. So everyone will hear the questions and uh, we will hear the speaker's responses. So now I'm going to turn over to Jill Martin, who is going to introduce our speaker today. Jill is on the board at the Trust uh, and is also a member of the team that organises events just like this one. So Jill, could I ask you to unmute and present our speaker, introduce our speaker today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rona. I am delighted actually to welcome our speaker today, Thomas Fisher. Tom is a professor of, at the School of Architecture at the University of Minnesota, where he is also director of the Minnesota Design Center. His writing output is remarkable and his works are really influential. He has written or edited 11 books, 70 book chapters, and over 450 articles in professional journals and major publications. In 2005, he was recognized as the fifth most published architect, architecture writer in the United States. As his writing suggests, he has long played a defining role within his profession, including as editorial director of the magazine Progressive Architecture. Although Tom will be speaking to us today from St. Paul, Minnesota, he has strong connections with New Haven where he lived with his family for 12 years from 1984 to 1996. His preservation interests in New Haven are longstanding for during those years, he was the historical architect for the Connecticut State Historical Preservation Office. His knowledge of the city of New Haven is remarkable. Recognizing the potential in New Haven, his commitment to the future of our city is absolute. Indeed, he terms New Haven his second home. Please join me in welcoming onto your screen, Thomas Fisher, who will speak to us today about Cass Gilbert and his plan for New Haven. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. I'm going to share my screen. Good to be there. Uh, good to be in virtually there in New Haven, uh, which as Jill said, I consider my second home. Um, not only was my wife, Claudia, born and raised on Eld Street in New Haven, but we, we lived there for 12 years and on Whitney Avenue and in two different places on Orange Street. Both my daughters were born at New Haven, Yale New Haven Hospital. And um, so we try to get back to New Haven when we can. And although COVID-19 prevents us from physically being there, it's really great to be back virtually. In many ways, uh, the connection between St. Paul, Minnesota, where I uh, am right now, and New Haven um, has uh, long made me interested in the work of Cass Gilbert, who is uh, an architect who probably is familiar to just about everybody in this webinar, but who also bridged between uh, Connecticut and Minnesota. And so I want to talk about Cass Gilbert and uh, his career in sort of three different parts. I know that there are several uh, on this webinar who are both from Minnesota as well as from New Haven and Connecticut. And so I thought I would just talk a bit about his work in both places because I assume perhaps my 
uh, Connecticut friends have not necessarily seen his work in Minnesota, or perhaps he, um, my Minnesota colleagues haven't seen some of his work in Connecticut. And so I thought I would just look at some of his uh, built work. Um, and then I wanted to talk about Cass Gilbert as an urban designer uh, and look at some of the major urban design projects that he did that were noteworthy and that really informed his plan for New Haven. And then the third part of my talk will focus in on the plan for New Haven and why I wanna make the case that it is newly relevant, uh, particularly in the post pandemic world. So uh, here are two images of uh, Cass Gilbert on the left as a younger architect when he was uh, uh, practicing in uh, St. Paul. And then uh, on the right uh, as, a, as an older man when he was uh, working in New York and living in uh, Richfield, Connecticut. Uh, Gilbert um, was born in 1859 in Zanesville, Ohio, not too far from where I was born in Ohio. I moved to St. Paul when he was nine. Um, his father died and his mother moved to St. Paul. He uh, started college at McAllister College in St. Paul, although dropped out and then uh, went to MIT to study architecture, after which he went to work for McKinney and White in uh, New York City. Uh, and then eventually moved back um, at age, uh, in his early twenties to St. Paul and opened an office with his, uh, his friend, James Knox Taylor, uh, uh, and then later he had a partnership with the architect Clarence Johnston, who um, you will see some of his work as part of what um, Cass Gilbert did. And then eventually Gilbert moved uh, his primary office to New York City, although he did maintain a, a, also an office in St. Paul for a while as well. And so um, uh, let me just begin by um, showing you some of the work to show that um, he was actually uh, uh, quite a, uh, did a lot of diverse work and, and quite skillful in working in a lot of different modes. I think if you're familiar with his work from the East Coast, for example, in Connecticut, um, he's often viewed as a, as a classicist, although his early work in uh, St. Paul is anything but that. So first, uh, a bit about Cass Gilbert, the architect. Uh, so uh, as those in New Haven know, of course, he designed Union Station, um, in New Haven, but he uh, had a, quite a career doing railroad depots across the upper tier of uh, states in the US, working for um, uh, the Great Northern Railroad and uh, Northern Pacific Railroad. Here are two examples of uh, train stations by Cass Gilbert, one in Little Falls, Minnesota on the left and uh, in Fargo, North Dakota on the right. And so as you can see, and these were done in the 1890s, um, uh, Gilbert practiced uh, in a range of styles from almost a sort of Richardsonian quality of the, of the building on the right to a much more eclectic kind of Shavian uh, half timbered look on the left. So he, he was quite facile in, in uh, moving across a variety of architectural styles. Here are just two of several houses he did in St. Paul. Some of these along Summit Avenue, which is a, a, a street of uh, large distinguished houses in, in St. Paul, the, the uh, Leitner House, uh, 1893 on the left in a kind of Richardsonian Romanesque uh, style and then the Livingston House in uh, 1898 on the right. And, um, and so this was a sort of characteristic of his uh, St. Paul practice doing uh, railroad stations um, and uh, many uh, large houses. He also um, did quite a number of churches. This is the uh, Dayton Avenue Presbyterian Church in St. Paul from the 1885-86 uh, and the Virginia Street Church of 1886 on the right, one of my favorites, a, a really interesting shingle style um, uh, uh, church. Um, on the, uh, and so again, it, he would customize the approach to his buildings depending on the client and um, the, the mode that seemed appropriate at the time. Uh, he also uh, did office buildings. Uh, this is the um, Gilbert warehouse, the Gilbert building on the left, which was a warehouse in downtown St. Paul and then um, the Endicott building on the right. Uh, both of these uh, from the early uh, 1890s. And again, you can see how he practiced uh, in, at that point in his career in a kind of Renaissance revival mode um, in these buildings, uh, which are very much loved in the, in the city of St. Paul and, 
and as you can see in the building on the left, even renamed in honor of Gilbert's name. But um, around this time, he was also starting to do work elsewhere um, in New York, for example, the, the Broadway Chambers building in New York City from uh, 1889 on the left was his first major project in uh, New York. And of course, became really internationally known for the Woolworth building on the, on the right, um, which he started in 1910, the same year that he uh, was working on the plan for New Haven and which uh, at the time was the world's uh, tallest building. And, uh, and so this uh, projects like this really started to draw Gilbert away from St. Paul and he had opened up his uh, New York office and uh, continued to be very prolific in doing major commissions really all over the country, uh, including, for example, the Detroit Public Library uh, on the uh, upper image there from uh, 1935, really completed after, um, uh, well, no, the Detroit Library was done in 1921. The Supreme Court in 1935 on the bottom was completed after uh, Gilbert had uh, passed away in, in 1934. Um, so again, those are all, I think, relatively well-known buildings. Um, for uh, those of you in Connecticut, of course, you know a lot of his Connecticut work. Uh, for example, these two buildings in Waterbury, Connecticut, one, the City Hall, um, uh, on, the, on the left from uh, 1914, and then the Chase Brass and Copper headquarters building on the right from um, 1917, 1918. Uh, and so for uh, ensembles of buildings like these, he worked in a, uh, a, a classical mode that I think characterized a lot of his uh, later work. And then finally, uh, to New Haven, um, the two uh, major works of which are the, is Union Station on the left, about which I'll talk quite a bit about in a minute. And uh, of course, it is the free public library on the right. Um, and so I think that um, these are, I thought, uh, examples uh, of uh, what made, I think, Gilbert such a popular architect and um, such a prolific architect over his entire career is that he was able to work on a wide variety of building types and a wide variety of kind of architectural modes. Um, and um, managed generally to have good relationships with uh, his clients, although not always, and I'll talk about that in a minute, some of which came up in his work as an urban designer. So um, one of the, the major projects from uh, the sort of early part of his career when he was in St. Paul was his uh, winning the commission to do the Minnesota State Capitol, uh, which uh, was a project that went from 1895 to 1905. And, and um, was just recently restored. Um, this was, uh, you know, obviously a major commission for any architect, and um, in some ways, uh, really put uh, Gilbert initially on the national map for doing a building of this sort. But I think what's interesting about uh, this is that uh, he didn't just do the building; he was very concerned about the approach to the building and um, took it upon himself to um, actually make urban design suggestions for. The, the building. At the time, the building was on a hill overlooking downtown St. Paul, which is the sort of lower left in this image, um, and uh, was surrounded actually by houses and uh, corner stores and quite a diversity of, of urban fabric. There was also the St. Paul Cathedral um, on the other hill. Um, and so what he was uh, interested in is making a connection between uh, the state capitol and the cathedral, the state capitol and the downtown, as well as this long uh, alley uh, uh, promenade, uh, which would connect the state capitol down to the Mississippi River, which is on the left, uh, to the left of this image. And um, so again, you see Gilbert uh, not just being interested in architecture, but concerned about the larger urban fabric and um, uh, about the ways in which he saw cities growing, which of course is really, I think, important to understand the work that he did for the plan of New Haven. Uh, he was also not shy in um, cutting through a lot of existing streets, uh, right through um, uh, existing blocks, very uh, houseman-like in the way in which he uh, uh, sort of saw it being important that cities be willing to, through eminent domain, uh, um, take property to uh, achieve 
uh, a larger sort of civic mission, a larger public goal. And so you can see here the, the kind of diversity of streets that were coming together in St. Paul and how um, particularly the, this uh, uh, connection out to the Mississippi River and over to the St. Paul Cathedral cut right through a number of streets. Uh, and so again, uh, we'll come back to this when we talk about uh, New Haven. But I think that it shows uh, an attitude toward governance, which uh, in some ways was uh, misaligned with a lot of attitudes um, in the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, cities like St. Paul, like New Haven were, were major industrial cities. Um, there was uh, a large presence of um, uh, wealthy individuals in the case of St. Paul, people like James J. Hill, who um, ran the railroads and, and uh, Gilbert worked for. Um, but um, this idea that the government would um, utilize eminent domain to this extent to cut through this amount of private property was quite a statement about the sort of relationship between the public and the private and a reassertion on the part of Gilbert and other city beautiful movement urban designers that there was a, an important role for the government to play to create cities that were of the quality and stature of what they saw in European capitals. This is an image um, actually from uh, a 1922 plan. And so it's interesting to me about uh, Gilbert is that even in, when he was largely practicing in New York, he was staying involved in St. Paul and continued to push this idea of the need for a connection between the state capital um, and um, Seven Corners, which is a, a part of the city at the lower part of this image where several different streets come together as well as to the Mississippi River. And in fact, he never really gave up. Uh, this, this is an image um, from uh, 1931 plan. So just a few year, years before uh, Gilbert died, he was still um, looking at the possibility of uh, a major urban design intervention in St. Paul, in this case, going all the way to the river and um, uh, sort of rationalizing the ways in which various streets came together in a series of uh, plazas. Uh, and again, I mention this because of its relevance to uh, what he proposed uh, in New Haven. Uh, but he did other urban design projects as well. Um, uh, this, by the way, is another image. Um, uh, oh, and um, here's just some uh, images of um, uh, a few years old, but still showing how eventually the um, capital uh, area did uh, achieve something, somewhat of what Gilbert uh, had envisioned in some of his ideas. For example, uh, this idea of, a, of a, a divided mall that would connect the capital into the downtown. As you can see here on the image on the right, never could quite get it to the river. Uh, there was always uh, too many buildings in the way. And the same thing happened in the, the, the long um, sort of plaza that extends from the capital which uh, again, um, Gilbert had hoped uh, would um, connect to the river and it got cut off by the highway. And so um, as, all, you know, as often as the case with urban design, um, they uh, rarely get fully realized, but you can, I think, still see in what was achieved around the, the Minnesota capital that um, uh, s uh, some of what Gilbert had proposed clearly had an effect. Uh, Another project uh, that uh, a major urban design project he did was the uh, uh, campus plan for the University of Minnesota. This too was a competition that he won. Um, and here you can see uh, his competition uh, drawing um, of envisioning a um, sort of neoclassical campus in the bend of the Mississippi River. Um, and in many ways, turning its back on the historic campus, which is uh, in the upper part of this image here. And so Gilbert, again, was a person who um, made no small plans to use the Burnham phrase. He believed that um, a, a strong, clear, organized urban plan um, was what was necessary to be able to accommodate a lot of change over time. And as you can see with this image, this is what he was working with at the time. There was a relatively small campus here and then there was a residential neighborhood south of the uh, campus with a rail line going between the two. And you can see on the right how uh, um, uh, Gilbert sort of reimagined that. He ran the rail line under the campus 
in a tunnel, um, basically eliminated the entire residential neighborhood and envisioned a uh, auditorium, a major building at the end of this mall with a series of academic buildings, administrative buildings along it. Um, and then a uh, set of buildings that would step down to a plaza on the Mississippi River. Uh, and uh, here are some other uh, images from that time. Um, now I'd mentioned that Gilbert sometimes had some tense relationships with clients, including in this case, the University of Minnesota. Uh, although he uh, did uh, win this competition and did the basic and overall urban design plan, um, he had a falling out with the regents of the university um, and ended up uh, not doing the buildings. Uh, here is an image of the uh, current Northrop Mall that um, Gilbert envisioned uh, stepping down to the river, although many of the buildings were actually designed by Clarence Johnston, uh, his um, at the time now former partner when he was doing these buildings. And so uh, Gilbert uh, did not actually have the opportunity to do much of the architecture, even though his urban design ideas were uh, sort of fundamental to the organization of the, of the university. Uh, he also, uh, around the time of um, his uh, work in New Haven, was um, also working at the University of Texas in Austin. This is his proposed urban design plan for that campus um, and did some buildings like um, um, Battle Hall, which was on the, is on the right here, which was the original library uh, for the, the campus is now uh, one of the buildings that the School of Architecture occupies at the UT Austin campus. Um, and uh, Gilbert uh, got along better with the Texans than he did with the Minnesotans because he stayed on as the uh, University of Texas architect from 1910 to 1922. Um, and so uh, it did have an impact uh, on that campus. Although actually the, the final urban design plan was one that was done by uh, Paul Cray. Um, and uh, Cray actually uh, also did many of the buildings on the UT campus and uh, Gilbert's buildings, Battle Hall, you can see here on the left on this image on the left, sort of got overshadowed, overshadowed by uh, the work of Cray. But again, um, the idea of a major landmark building at the end of a mall with a series of academic buildings flanking it uh, was an idea that was originally Gilbert's and uh, just uh, was done at a much larger scale as the University of Texas really grew beyond uh, the scope of what Gilbert uh, had originally uh, envisioned. And so uh, that's a bit of the background on um, Cass Gilbert as an urban designer. And I thought it was uh, important to understand uh, as we talk about New Haven um, and the, the plan for New Haven, which uh, Cass Gilbert did with uh, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. Um, in uh, 1910. Uh, this is a, a book that has been uh, a facsimile of which has been reproduced, uh, was published uh, by the Trinity University Press in 2012. For those of you who don't know it, I highly recommend it. It's um, not only a fascinating look at urban design thinking from the early 20th century, but there are really terrific pieces in it, a preface by Vincent Scully, a, a, an introduction by Alan Plattis, and an afterward by uh, Douglas Ray. And so uh, their commentary on, on the plan, um, I think are, they're all really very insightful. And the plan itself, I think, um, as I wanna make a case in my talk today, is one that is very much worth returning to. And I say that not because I'm necessarily an advocate in the City Beautiful movement, but um, I wanna make the case that there are ideas in this plan that are newly relevant for the 21st century, um, particularly into the, the post-pandemic future uh, that we are all um, uh, about to face. Uh, so just a little bit about the plan. Um, they were commissioned by the New Haven uh, Civic Improvement Commission um, an organization that a, a Yale faculty member, George Dudley uh, Seymour led. Um, I think they first approached uh, Gilbert and uh, as, as the urban designer and Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. as a landscape architect in, in 1907. And the plan was uh, delivered uh, to uh, Mayor Frank Rice uh, in December of 1910. So the, the plan is just about 110 years old. Um, I think the, the challenge, and, and Douglas Ray's piece really gets into this very insightfully, is that um, Mayor Rice was not a uh, 
not particularly inclined to accept the plan. He never really budgeted money to implement it. Um, he um, uh, never really called the, uh, he, there was a newly created city plan commission uh, that, that um, the council put together, but that the mayor never called. Eventually Seymour uh, uh, resigned because um, there was no sort of political will uh, to actually implement the plan. Uh, there were I, parts of it though that, that were very influential. There was quite a bit in there about improvements of parks, uh, the installation of playgrounds uh, and reducing overcrowding in some parts of the city. And those aspects of the plan um, actually were eventually implemented. And so it's not as if the plan didn't have an effect, but um, uh, some of the major recommendations um, did not happen. For example, there was a belief um, that the city of New Haven would continue to grow so that um, they envisioned a city that by later in the 20th century would be 400 for over 400,000 people. And of course that never happened. Um, the plan came in 1910, just as automobiles were starting to become fashionable and, and widely used. And as we know, uh, the auto-centric suburbanization that happened in greater New Haven, like so many cities around the country, led um, many cities to not have the kind of population increase that was anticipated in, in 1910. Um, there was also quite a lot of talk in the plan about widening streets, in part because there was a perception that the city would get much bigger and that the, um, the width of the streets from the um, original uh, nine squares of New Haven, as well as the rest of the urban fabric that uh, had been put in place in the 19th century uh, were too narrow for the volume of traffic uh, that they an anticipated. So they called for a, a building line committee uh, to uh, sort of systematically as new buildings got built, um, push the, the sort of frontages back that would enable the city over time to widen streets. And uh, needless to say, that, that didn't happen. Um, but I think that to me, one of the more interesting pieces of the plan was this proposal on the part of Gilbert to connect his Union Station here on the lower left back into the center of uh, New Haven with this new diagonal uh, avenue, 120 foot wide uh, uh, boulevard um, that would connect uh, the, the station to uh, a widened uh, Temple Street uh, where Congress Avenue comes in. Um, and he envisioned this as a kind of uh, grand boulevard. And uh, he also called for a plaza around the station. And the way he talks about it in the plan is that he saw this station plaza as having public and semi-public buildings. He also called for a possible portal to a subway, which in 1910 thought was inevitable for a city such as New Haven to have a below grade subway. Uh, but when he uh, came to explain why he thought a, a, an avenue like this was necessary, he said that, quote, the first impression of most visitors to the city will be um, on emerging from the station. The first impression is a lasting one. And upon this impression will be largely based the opinion of the city as formed by its visitors a bit florid uh, uh, syntax there, but nevertheless, you get the idea that um, he really viewed the, the station as the sort of entry point uh, into the city and thought that it was important that it, there be a clear way uh, to move from the, the train station into the heart of the city. Uh, and at the time, um, there was a lot of um, industrial and residential districts and uh, various blocks uh, between the station and the downtown. Um, here's just uh, some other sketches that are in the plan. Uh, what's interesting is that he, he actually showed the development of this idea over time. So he, he showed some early sketches such as this one. Um, and, um, and then it was it slowly evolved over time. He began to think about uh, how some of the um, streets uh, might be eliminated so that there were better connections into this boulevard. He had this um, sort of parallel set of streets on other, either side of the avenue. Um, and what I think is significant, and I'll get back to this in a minute, 
is he never actually talked about uh, the function of the buildings along this avenue. And I think that's important. I mean, 1910 predates the 1926 uh, Supreme Court decision of Euclid versus Ambler Realty, which was the Supreme Court decision which really put in place modern zoning as we know it, uh, after which we started to see cities having single use zones put into effect where there were residential zones, industrial zones, commercial zones, and what have you. And so this plan predates that. And I, and I wanna make the case that that's really important, particularly as we look into the future. And so um, what uh, Gilbert was doing in this plan was really uh, talking about how the infrastructure could be laid out to facilitate development without necessarily saying what kind of development there would be. And in fact, he suggests that there would be a range of different types, including things that look like they might have a parking in the middle, uh, surrounded by buildings, uh, a kind of early example of um, the single loaded uh, wrapper buildings around parking uh, garages that you, you see today. And, um, but again, he was remaining agnostic as to uh, the, the functions. These are just some other sketches. Uh, as you can see, he was really committed to this idea. He was trying to sell the idea as, as maybe one of the most important aspects of his plan. Um, and uh, in this drawing, he, he shows how um, Temple, uh, Temple Street would be widened uh, after it leaves the green and then connect into this square uh, that would um, uh, also connect uh, what looks like to be an underground passage. Again, he had this idea of some sort of subway system um, that would uh, exist in the city. Uh, and this is a drawing um, courtesy of uh, Eric Vogt, uh, Vogt who's, um, the website New Haven Urbanism, for those um, from New Haven, you probably know it, I think is an excellent source of ideas about the city, but this is a drawing that sort of includes both um, Gilbert's uh, railroad station, avenue plan, new square, Temple Street connection to the uh, urban design work um, that uh, uh, James Russell Pope had done for Yale uh, in 1919. And so this, I think, is a, is a really excellent sort of combination of those two urban design schemes and showing how the city could be really thought of as an ensemble where you would get off the train station, come down the avenue, connect into the Temple Street, get into the downtown, uh, connect over to Yale and potentially go up Hill House Avenue to Science Hill um, uh, at the far end. And so it was really viewed as a continuous uh, uh, procession through the city. Uh, and here are just again from the New Urbanism, New Haven Urbanism site, some images that sort of show uh, on the left from 1934, here's the train station and the, the density of development right around it. Again, mostly residential, some industrial. And then what happened um, in the wake of urban renewal in, 18, in 1965, where uh, not only was the Oak Street connector put in, but there was a lot of the clearance of this whole area, including most of the uh, uh, district right in front of the train station, which um, I would argue was an opportunity to envision Gilbert's plan, but that opportunity wasn't taken. Um, Mayor Richard Lee, as many of us know, um, uh, came into the uh, mayoral seat in 1953 and was a major figure in um, the redevelopment of uh, New Haven including this plan on the left by Mies van der Rohe for uh, the area around Church Street South, right in front of the station. Interestingly enough, it looks as if he was also calling for the removal of um, Gilbert's station with a with this uh, longer block here. And what's striking uh, about this to me is how so many of these plans treat the station as an afterthought. I mean, it's there uh, in this drawing um, but there's no really clear connection. In fact, the attention is really given to the um, uh, ramps on and off the Oak Street connector rather than the train station. Uh, by the 19, by mid 1950s, probably train travel was in decline and people thought it um, was not necessarily relevant to an auto-centric city. And I think Mises' um, uh, scheme here shows that. And of course, um, you know, by 1969, uh, Charles Moore's Church Street South housing 
had been developed. I think what's to me significant about this is how it's represented as if it's in an island. Uh, there's no context shown. And so the, the station is uh, uh, located here. And, um, but um, Moore's plan does very little to sort of acknowledge that. And it's, in fact, in some ways turns its back on the station um, and had a very inward uh, set of plazas and um, pedestrian areas. Um, so again, this sense um, that the, the station was there, um, but not particularly important to the city. And of course, here's an image of, the, of uh, Moore's uh, housing development, which of course has now been demolished. Um, and uh, as those in New Haven know, there's been um, at least a couple uh, redevelopment plans for that whole area. Uh, this one, um, uh, as part of the Union Square master plan from the city's uh, hill to downtown uh, community plan. Um, I think there was a lot of great um, community participation in the development of this plan. But one of the things that's striking to me, again, the here's the station on the right, is that in many ways, this still um, does not really uh, do the station much justice. There is, there is a, a, a Union Square here, there is a, a connection. But if you were uh, somebody who didn't know New Haven and got off the train station, you wouldn't necessarily know where to go. You wouldn't know how to get to the downtown uh, with a plan like this. You would find yourself in the middle of um, a fairly traditional new urbanism development and would have to figure out how you would get to the center of town or to um, the, the medical uh, complex, Yale New Haven uh, Hospital and, and all of the facilities around it. And, and this uh, is the Northland uh, scheme from 2012, again, um, a mix, a kind of new urbanism mix of residential office development. There is this plaza across from the station, but again, uh, for a visitor, somebody who didn't know New Haven, um, there are buildings in the way between you and um, the major destinations for, for um, the city. And so uh, the point I wanna make here is that I think we uh, have often, and I, by the way, took uh, the train almost every day for 12 years. So I was a frequent user of the train station uh, and um, always felt that um, the, the approach to it was uh, not necessarily the best. So here we are now uh, with uh, the, the housing gone. Um, and here is the view outside the, the Union Station, um, a fence uh, and open space, no sense of how to actually get uh, either to the medical complex or to the downtown and to Yale. And uh, frankly, the pedestrian experience is pretty grim. Uh, in many ways, walking downtown is along this street and under the bridge uh, and uh, not necessarily the, the most welcoming experience or going the other way on uh, Church Street South as you uh, again have a long and pretty desolate walk into the city. So it's not a pedestrian friendly way uh, to get into the city from people who uh, are uh, disembarking from a train. Um, and let me just end by making this point that uh, New Haven, I have always felt it has tremendous opportunity. I was on a panel back in 1994 on the future of the American city, where I made the argument that even back then that um, meds and eds are what are going to be the kind of base for the economies of 21st century cities. And New Haven has world-class eds and meds, has one of the, the top premier um, medical complexes. Uh, and it obviously with Yale has one of the great universities in the world. And uh, so it has the components to be um, a major city, a global city. Um, and yet uh, it makes it difficult for somebody coming to the city by train to figure out how to get there. And to follow on what Gilbert said, it doesn't make a great first impression when you come out of Union Station. And yet it's a quarter of a mile walk to the medical complex and another quarter of a mile walk to both the community college and, and to Yale. And so it's not very far. Um, those are uh, pedestrian oriented distances. Um, and yet it's, we've created a, a not very pedestrian friendly environment around the station. Um, 
And yet the opportunity, and one reason I wanted to give this talk is I think there's an opportunity here, um, a kind of window of time that the city uh, might re-imagine uh, what Gilbert's ideas were. Obviously, the Temple Street connection doesn't work, but um, Church Street is connected over the Oak Street connector. Um, and there is now for the first time in a very long time, a straight shot potentially to some sort of a knuckle that would both enable pedestrians to access all of the, the medical um, facilities, the uh, nursing school, everything that is here, and then another straight shot right into the downtown. And so um, I put forward an idea like this. Of course, this is just um, the beginning of a conversation, but one that I think and I hope that um, the city of New Haven might have, which is to reimagine what its plans are for this district in a way that is, uh, makes a better connection between the train station and some sort of public plaza that Gilbert called for and some sort of a direct line, be it a, uh, a boulevard with cars or a pedestrian connection that would enable uh, visitors uh, coming out of Union Station to see where they're going to connect right up to all of the medical complex and then be able to connect over the Oak Street connector into the downtown and to Yale. And to reimagine what some of the, the um, urban fabric might be. And the, the reason I brought up the point about uh, zoning is that um, we're doing quite a lot of work in my center around the, the pandemic and the long-term effect of it. And what we see going forward is a move away from um, single use zoning and from even the specifying of the use of buildings and moving toward a way of thinking about buildings as being much more flexible. So along the lines of what Gilbert and Olmsted were suggesting is that we focus on the creation of civic space and we let the marketplace decide whether it's going to be residential, it's gonna be office, whether it might be light industrial, uh, whether there may be some sort of retail as part of this, maybe uh, various kinds of production or educational facilities. And in fact, we see urban fabric going forward as being much more mixed use, much more flexible, uh, and in that way also much more affordable than what single use zoning, Euclidean zoning has enabled uh, since 1926. Uh, and also just to begin to uh, uh, sort of think about um, what New Haven might um, adopt in terms of what great streets are happening around the world to sort of reimagine this boulevard that Gilbert and Olmsted called for, uh, not necessarily in the form that they drew it, but in terms of uh, what is happening around the world in terms of what cities are doing to attract talent. Because I still believe that New Haven is a place that has uh, the, the world-class facilities, world-class environment, and it needs world-class streets, uh, uh, particularly at the portal into the city from the train station um, now more than ever. So maybe I'll end with just uh, the last line in Douglas Ray's uh, essay in the book where he goes, um, quote, we now find ourselves attempting to undo some of the damage wrought by the latest generation of master planning. And as we do so, turning back to the unfinished work of the 1910 plan. I would encourage New Haven to uh, once again, turn back to the unfinished work of Gilbert and Olmsted and create the kind of environment around Union Station that the city so much deserves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, we would very much like to hear from our audience with any questions you have at this point. Uh, please add your questions to the chat. Let me give people a minute. Any questions? Tom, are you seeing any questions at the moment? I'm not. I uh, oh, yeah. I don't, but we. I think there are some interest in finding out if there are any city planners out there from New Haven who are who would like to respond to what you've just been saying. If there are any city planners in our audience? Yeah. 
So we have a question about why the, the train station is so far from the center and the location of the train station in the first place. Uh, that's a great question. I mean, uh, Gilbert actually addresses that in the plan. Um, a lot of it has to do with just the, the um, uh, uh, logistics of, of train movement. Um, the, um, the, the location of Union Station was pretty much fixed by uh, the, where the yard was, where the sidings were, um, and where it was most easily accessible by trains. And so, um, of course, as you know, we all know, um, there's the State Street Station as well that is, um, um, was put in place after I had left New Haven, which of course gives uh, closer access to um, the center of the city. But, um, you know, it's interesting now that I haven't lived in New Haven now for 24 years, I, I look back on New Haven and um, miss it in many ways, but also um, now see it more as an outsider. Um, and it, I still think that Union Station is the arrival point for most people coming along the Northeast Corridor. Um, and uh, and so even though there is a, state, a smaller State Street station, um, I still think that the uh, Union Station is the, is the place we can assume most visitors coming to New Haven will, will disembark. And so um, I also think that um, the, the connection up to all of the, the medical facilities on the other side of the Oak Street connector, which is on the side of Union Station is really also a, a major opportunity um, for the city. We have a, an interesting question about whether there is any, any thought or there was thought or there is thought of connecting to the harbor and to the mm. waterfront rather than just into the city. Yeah, that's, that's also a great idea. And I, I think there's been some, um, I'm not sure, I remember reading in the New Haven Urbanism site uh, something about a harbor plan. And again, I'm not, um, uh, you know, sort of following in detail all of the planning that's going on there. But um, I agree. I think this connection over the uh, rail yard um, to the harbor is uh, a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, also some interest in why the Charles Moore housing was demolished. Yes. Uh, well, again, some of you in New Haven may know a little bit more about that story than I do. Um, uh, you know, I can address it architecturally. I, you know, I, there are no doubt all sorts of other reasons for its demolition. I, I mean, I, I do think that um, this was part of a, a number of sort of small urban design related works that Charles Moore did. I mean, he had done Kresge College out at, at the UC Santa Cruz. Um, and he was fascinated by sort of Italian hill towns it had this kind of hilltown like quality to it. Um, it was in many ways quite charming. And I, I've, I've read some of the statements of people who lived in that, that development and loved it. It's so found it to be a great community. Um, there's actually many aspects of it architecturally I also admired. I just think that urbanistically, it um, um, actually looked too inward and, um, turned its back on the city. And I think that that was actually, uh, you know, one of the challenges that when you came out of Union Station, you saw the, the project. And even though there was a plaza, there was a labyrinthian quality about it that really discouraged visitors from walking through it. Um, and so, you know, I, while I admire much of what Charles Moore did, I don't think it was the right uh, development for that location. Uh, a related question. People are interested to know what this means for the Oak Street connector for MLK Boulevard. What, how does that fit within the plan? Well, I don't know if you noticed, but the little sketch I did, I actually, uh, what we're starting to do uh, and talk about in Minnesota and it's happened in other cities, uh, Seattle's doing this, Columbus, Ohio has done it recently, which is uh, building um, uh, and, and as New Haven has done with the, the new pharmaceutical building and the garages over by Yale New Haven Hospital is building over the Oak Street connector, mm -hmm. essentially burying the Oak Street connector. Um, I think that would be a, a wise thing to do. 
Um, and so, you know, when I sort of showed this connection over the Church Street Bridge into the downtown by Gateway Community College, was the idea of actually building buildings on both sides of the bridge mm -hmm. so that as you're crossing the bridge, you don't see the highway. You basically feel as if you're still in the city. Mm -hmm. And so the buildings become a kind of buffer between the street um, and the highway. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting, my, my centers, we have a National Science Foundation grant where we're looking at the impact of autonomous vehicles, which is also going to sort of transform our whole transportation system. But one of the things that's interesting is autonomous vehicles actually avoid highways. Um, they don't wanna to go to highways because highways are congested. So it might be interesting to someday envision actually taking the Oak Street connector out um, and uh, returning to, um, you know, a grade level street or set of streets um, I have a feeling that eventually that will happen. Well, in terms of eventually what will happen, there are also uh, a couple of questions about what conversations are being had. Has, has this plan been, have you had conversations with city planners in New Haven? Have you a sense of what our timeline would be? What would be, how would we move forward? I haven't, I must say, um, I thought I would use this lecture just to start the conversation. Um, and in hopes that um, all my, my New Haven friends might find it interesting enough to see if it can, might move forward. I'd be happy to stay involved if that would be useful, but um, I just think that this is uh, something New Haven should do. Um, and I say that from 1500 miles away, I care deeply about the city and I wanna see it thrive as it's beginning to do, but I, I, you know, as it is doing, actually, I should say, I mean, I'm continually impressed every time I go back to New Haven to see all the things that are going on. Um, but I do think that there's still an underappreciation of, of, of Union Station and the connection to it. Uh, well, the, the final comment that's just come in says, please talk to them, it's a great plan. So <laughs> you have a resounding plea. Okay. We have one other question I would like to raise that somebody asked. Um, how about the green square that already exists between the station and the medical complex? Nobody is ever sitting there. It's mm -hmm. a waste that could be incorporated into a walk from station to green. Yeah, I agree. I mean, public space is only as good as what uh, surrounds it and what is adjacent to it. And, um, you know, while, you know, Gilbert focused on the, the avenue, the 120 foot wide avenue, uh, I'm just as interested in how th that Church Street South area can really be an opportunity to reimagine zoning, reimagine development um, in the post pandemic world that is uh, a new way to think about how we build cities that are more affordable, more diverse, and much more flexible that are not so um, uh, tied down by uh, single use zoning ideas, but that really enable building owners to adapt their buildings to whatever the market seems to need at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's, it's, a, it's an enormous opportunity um, for the city, not just the infrastructure piece, but, but actually what development could be. There's, there's certainly a call amongst our, our comments um, to make the current walk much less bleak. Uh, as a walker, I certainly agree with that, um, that would be. I, I used to live on, at the, on Orange Street near the downtown. So I used to walk under that Oak Street connector bridge in it uh, by the police station. I mean, it is really dreary and, uh, and at night um, kind of scary too. So um, it, it can be much better than that. Yes, and indeed somebody has just noted that the, the, the New Haven Free Public Library that he designed contributes so much to this sense of civic pride Right. That, that, a, that a, a shape like this adds. Right. Sense. Yes. Um, lots of uh, positive uh, comments, lots of strong sense that people like this um, and would like to hear your talk, a recording of your talk. So I think it's certainly being picked up. Well, uh, it's very free. striking for me. I think we're just about at our time. Uh, so, uh, yes, there will be a recording, we hope, made available eventually, not immediately, but we will have a, a, a recording made available. Um, it's very striking for me that recent talks the Trust has had uh, at our annual meeting in 2019, we talked about the walkable city, that was the theme. Mm. And then our last, our first online talk was about stations, and both of those have had real resonances, the, the resurgence of the train, and the mm. idea that we might walk and 
as a cyclist, I would say, and cycle in the city. Right. And then this, which is being very positively received. So um, I hope this is a moment that you're capturing. And thank you very much, Tom, on the behalf of the Trust for a really beautifully composed and wonderfully illustrated and really convincingly argued uh, no. presentation today. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Rona. Great and to be back in New Haven, if just virtually. We look forward to welcoming you in person when we can. And I'd like to also to thank everybody who's attended here today. Um, it's been wonderful to have so many participants here in this rather dark evening now already by by four o'clock. Um, we are, um, you know, the trust is delighted to have this level of support for its, its programming. Uh, we would love to have you as members if you're not yet a member. Uh, this talk was funded from our Herzan Lecture Fund, which is, is uh, generated by people like our audience today. Uh, encouraging us to put on more programming like this. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Tom. And uh, stay well, stay healthy, stay safe. Good. Thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye, yeah. everybody.